Adventure the Fourth of Adventures of a Brownie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Allison Chapraki. The Adventures of a Brownie by Miss Mulock. Adventure the Fourth Brownie's Ride. For the little brownie, though not given to horsemanship, did once take a ride, and a very remarkable one it was. Shall I tell you all about it? The six little children got a present of something they had longed for all their lives, a pony. Not a rocking horse, but a real live pony. A Shetland pony, too, which had traveled all the way from the Shetland Isles to Devonshire, where everybody wondered at it for such a creature had not been seen in the neighborhood for years and years. She was no bigger than a donkey, and her coat, instead of being smooth like a horse, was shaggy like a young bear's. She had a long tail, which had never been cut, and such a deal of hair in her mane and over her eyes that it gave her quite a fierce countenance. In fact, among the mild and tame Devonshire beasts, the little Shetland pony looked almost like a wild animal. But in reality, she was the gentlest creature in the world. Before she had been many days with them, she began to know the children quite well, followed them about, ate corn out of the bowl they held out to her. Nay, one day, when the eldest little girl offered her bread and butter, she stooped her head and took it from the child's hand, just like a young lady. Indeed, Jess that was her name, was altogether so ladylike in her behavior that more than once Cook allowed her to walk in at the back door, where she stood politely warming her nose at the kitchen fire for a minute or two, then turned round and as politely walked out again. But she never did any mischief, and was so quiet and gentle a creature that she bade fair soon to become as great a pet in the household as the dog the cat, the kittens, the puppies, the fowls, the ducks, the cow, the pig, and all the other members of the family. The only one who disliked her and grumbled at her was the gardener. This was odd, because, though cross to children, the old man was kind to dumb beasts. Even his pig knew his voice and grunted, and held out his nose to be scratched, and he always gave each successive pig a name, Jack or Dick, and called them by it, and was quite affectionate to them, one after the other, until the very day that they were killed. But they were English pigs, and the pony was Scotch, and the Devonshire gardener hated everything Scotch, he said, because he was not used to groom's work, and the pony required such a deal of grooming on account of her long hair. More than once, gardener threatened to clip it short, and turn her into a regular English pony. But the children were in such distress at this that the mistress and mother forbade any such spoiling of Jess's personal appearance. At length, to keep things smooth and to avoid the rough words and even blows, which poor Jess sometimes got, they sought in the village for a boy to look after her and found a great rough shock-headed lad named Bill, who for a few shillings a week consented to come up every morning and learn the beginning of a groom's business, hoping to end, as his mother said he should, in sitting, like the squire's fat coachman, as broad as he was long, on top of the hammer cloth of a grand carriage, and do nothing all day but drive a pair of horses as stout as himself a few miles along the road and back again. Bill would have liked this very much, he thought, if he could have been a coachman all at once, for if there was one thing he disliked, it was work. He much preferred to lie in the sun all day and do nothing. He only agreed to come and take care of Jess, because she was such a very little pony that looking after her seemed next door to doing nothing. But when he tried it, he found his mistake. True, Jess was a very gentle beast, so quiet that the old mother hen with her fourteen chicks used instead of roosting with the rest of the fowls, to come regularly into the portion of the cowshed, which was partitioned off for a stable, and settle under a corner of Jess's manger for the night, 
and in the morning the chicks would be seen running about fearlessly among her feet and under her very nose. But for all that, she required a little management, for she did not like her long hair to be roughly handled. It took a long time to clean her, and though she did not scream out like some silly little children when her hair was combed, I am afraid she sometimes kicked and bounced about, giving Bill a deal of trouble. All the more trouble, the more impatient Bill was. And then he had to keep within call, for the children wanted their pony at all hours. She was their own especial property, and they insisted upon learning to ride, even before they got a saddle. Hard work it was to stick on Jess's bare back, but by degrees the boys did it, turn and turn about, and even gave their sisters a turn too, a very little one, just once round the field and back again, which was quite enough, they considered, for girls. But they were very kind to their little sisters, held them on so that they could not fall, and led Jess carefully and quietly, and altogether behaved as elder brothers should. Nor did they squabble very much among themselves, though sometimes it was rather difficult to keep their turns all fair, and remember accurately which was which. But they did their best, being on the whole extremely good children. And they were so happy to have their pony that they would have been ashamed to quarrel over her. Also, one very curious thing kept them on their good behavior. Whenever they did begin to misconduct themselves, to want to ride out of their turns, or to domineer over one another, or the boys, joining together, tried to domineer over the girls, as I grieve to say, boys not seldom do. They used to hear in the air, right over their heads, the crack of an unseen whip. It was none of theirs, for they had not got a whip. That was a felicity which their father had promised, when they all could ride like young gentlemen and ladies, but there was no missing the sound. Indeed, it always startled Jess, so that she set off galloping, and could not be caught again for many minutes. This happened several times, until one of them said, Perhaps it's the brownie. Whether it was or was not, it made them behave better for a good while, till one unfortunate day the two eldest began contending which should ride foremost and which hindmost on Jess's back, when crick crack went the whip in the air, frightening the pony so much that she kicked up her heels, tossed both the boys over her head, and scampered off, followed by a loud ha ha ha. It certainly did not come from the two boys who had fallen, quite safely, but rather unpleasantly, into a large nettle bed, whence they crawled out, rubbing their arms and legs, and looking too much ashamed to complain. But they were rather frightened and a little cross, for Jess took a skittish fit, and refused to be caught and mounted again, till the bell rang for school, when she grew as meek as possible. Too late, for the children were obliged to run indoors, and got no more rides for the whole day. Jess was, from this incident, supposed to be on the same friendly terms with Brownie as were the rest of the household. Indeed, when she came, the children had taken care to lead her up the coal cellar door and introduce her properly, for they knew Brownie was very jealous of strangers and often played them tricks. But after that piece of civility, he would be sure, they thought, to take her under his protection. And sometimes, when the little Shetlander was restless and pricked up her ears, looking preternaturally wise under those shaggy brows of hers, the children used to say to one another, Perhaps she sees the brownie. Whether she did or not, Jess sometimes seemed to see a good deal that others did not see, and was apparently a favorite with the brownie, for she grew and thrived so much that she soon became the pride and delight of the children and of the whole family. You would hardly have known her for the rough, shaggy, half-starved little beast that had arrived a few weeks before. Her coat was so silky, her limbs so graceful, and her head so full of intelligence that everybody admired her. Then, even Gardner began to admire her, too. "'I think I'll get upon her back. It will save me walking down to the village,' said he one day. And she actually carried him though, as his feet nearly touched the ground, it looked as if the man were carrying the pony and not the pony the man. And the children laughed so immoderately that he never tried it afterwards. 
nor Bill neither, though he had once thought he should like a ride, and got astride on Jess. But she quickly ducked her head down, and he tumbled over it. Eventually, she had her own tastes as to her riders, and much preferred the little people to big ones. Pretty Jess, when cantering around the paddock with the young folk, she really was quite a picture. And when at last she got a saddle, a new beautiful saddle, with a pommel to take off and on, so as to suit both boys and girls, how proud they all were, Jess included. That day they were allowed to take her into the market town, Gardner leading her, as Bill could not be trusted, and everybody, even the blacksmith, who hoped by and by to have the pleasure of shooing her, said what a beautiful pony she was. After this, Gardner treated Jess a great deal better, and showed Bill how to groom her, and he kept him close at it too, which Bill did not like at all. He was a very lazy lad, and whenever he could shirk work he did it, and many a time when the children wanted Jess, either there was nobody to saddle her, or she had not been properly groomed, or Bill was away at his dinner, and they had to wait till he came back and could put her in order to be taken out for a ride like a genteel animal, which I am afraid neither pony nor children enjoyed half so much as the old ways before Bill came. Still, they were gradually becoming excellent little horsemen and horsewomen, even the youngest, only four years old, whom all the rest were very tender over, and who was often held on Jess's back and given a ride out of her turn, because she was such a good little girl and never cried for it. And seldomer and seldomer was heard the mysterious sound of a whip in the air, which warned them of quarreling. Brownie hated quarreling. In fact, their only trouble was Bill, who never came to his work in time and never did things when wanted, and was ill-natured, lazy, and cross to the children, so that they disliked him very much. "'I wish the brownie would punish you,' said one of the boys. "'You'd behave better then.' "'The brownie!' cried Bill contemptuously. "'If I caught him, I'd kick him up in the air, like this!' And he kicked up his cap, his only cap it was, which, strange to relate, flew right up, ever so high, and lodged at the very top of a tree which overhung the stable, where it dangled for weeks and weeks, during which time poor Bill had to go bareheaded. He was very much vexed, and revenged himself by vexing on the children in all sorts of ways. They would have told their mother and asked her to send Bill away, only she had a great many anxieties just then, for their dear old grandmother was very ill, and they did not like to make a fuss about anything that would trouble her. So Bill stayed on, and nobody found out what a bad, ill-natured, lazy boy he was. But one day, the mother was sent for suddenly, not knowing when she should be able to come home again. She was very sad, and so were the children, for they loved their grandmother. And as the carriage drove off, they all stood crying round the front door for ever so long. The servants even cried too. All but Bill. "'It's an ill wind that blows nobody good,' said he. What a jolly time I shall have. I'll do nothing all day long. Those troublesome children shan't have Jess to ride. I'll keep her in the stable, and then she won't get dirty, and I shall have no trouble in cleaning her. Hurrah! What fun! He put his hands in his pockets and sat whistling the best part of the afternoon. The children had been so unhappy that for the day they quite forgot Jess, but the next morning after lessons were over, they came, begging for a ride. You can't get one. The stable door's locked, and I've lost the key. He had it in his pocket all the time. How is poor Jess to get her dinner? cried a thoughtful little girl. Oh, how hungry she will be! And the child was quite in distress, as were the two other girls. But the boys were more angry than sorry. It was very stupid of you, Bill, to lose the key. Look about and find it, or else break open the door. I won't, said Bill. I dare say the key will turn up before night, and if it doesn't, who cares? You get writing enough and too much. I'll not bother myself about it, or Jess either. And Bill sauntered away. He was a big fellow, and the little lads were rather afraid of him. But as he walked, he could not keep his hand out of his trousers pocket, where the key felt growing heavier and heavier, till he expected it every minute to tumble through and come out at his boots, 
convicting him before all the children of having told a lie. Nobody was in the habit of telling lies to them, so they never suspected him, but went innocently searching about for the key, Bill all the while clutching it fast. But every time he touched it, he felt his fingers pinched, as if there were a cockroach in his pocket, or a little lobster, or something anyhow that had claws. At last, fairly frightened, he made an excuse to go into the cow shed, took the key out of his pocket and looked at it, and finally hid it in a corner of the manger among the hay. As he did so, he heard a most extraordinary laugh, which was certainly not from Dolly the cow. And as he went out of the shed, he felt the same sort of pinch at his ankles, which made him so angry that he kept striking with his whip in all directions, but hit nobody, for nobody was there. But Jess, who as soon as she heard the children's voice, had set up a most melancholy whinnying behind the locked stable door, began to neigh energetically. And Boxer barked, and the hens cackled, and the guinea fowls cried, Come back! Come back! in their usual insane fashion. Indeed, the whole farmyard seemed in such an excited state, that the children got frightened lest gardeners should scold them, and ran away, leaving Bill master of the field. What an idle day he had! How he sat on the wall with his hands in his pockets, and lounged upon the fence, and sauntered round the garden. At any length, absolutely tired of doing nothing, he went and talked with the gardener's wife while she was hanging out the clothes. Gardner had come down to the lower field, with all the little folks after him, so that he knew nothing of Bill's idling, or it might have come to an end. By and by, Bill thought it was time to go home to his supper. But first I'll give Jess her corn, said he, double quantity, and then I need not come back to give her breakfast so early in the morning. So, you greedy beast, I'll be at you presently if you don't stop that noise. For Jess, at the sound of his footsteps, was heard to whinny in the most imploring manner, enough to have melted a heart of stone. The key! Where on earth did I put the key? cried Bill, whose constant habit it was to lay things out of his hand and then forget where he had put them, causing himself endless loss of time in searching for them, as now. At last, he suddenly remembered the corner of the cow's manger, where he had felt sure he had left it. But the key was not there. You can't have eaten it, you silly old cow, said he, striking Dolly on the nose as she rubbed herself against him. She was an affectionate beast. Nor you, you stupid old hen, kicking the mother of the brood, who with her fourteen chicks began to shut out of their usual roosting place, Jess's stable, kept pecking about under Dolly's legs. It can't have gone without hands. Of course it can't. But most certainly the key was gone. What in the world should Bill do? Jess kept on making a pitiful complaining. No wonder, as she had not tasted food since morning. It would have made any kind-hearted person quite sad to see her, thinking how exceedingly hungry the poor pony must be. Little did Bill care for that, or for anything, except that he should be sure to get into trouble as soon as he was found out. When he heard Gardner coming into the farmyard, with the children after him, Bill bolted over the wall like a flash of lightning and ran away home, leaving poor Jess to her fate. All the way, he seemed to hear at his heels a little dog yelping, and then a swarm of gnats buzzing round his head, and altogether was so perplexed and bewildered that when he got into his mother's cottage he escaped into bed and pulled the blanket over his ears to shut out the noise of the dog and the gnats, which at last turned into a sound like somebody laughing. It was not his mother. She didn't often laugh, poor soul. Bill bothered her quite too much for that, and he knew it. Dreadfully frightened, he hid under the bedclothes, determined to go to sleep and think about nothing till the next day. Meantime, Gardner returned with all the little people trooping after him. He had been rather kinder to them than usual this day, because he knew their mother had gone away in trouble, and now he let them help him roll the gravel, and fetch Dolly up to be milked and watch him milk her in the cowshed, where, it being nearly winter, she always spent the night now. They were so well amused that they forgot all about their disappointment as to the ride, and Jess did not remind them of it by her whinnying. For as soon as Bill was gone, she grew quite silent. At last, one little girl, the one who had cried over Jess's being left hungry, remembered the poor pony, 
and peeping through a crevice in the cowshed, saw her stand contentedly munching in a large bowl full of corn. So Bill did find the key. I'm very glad, thought the kind little maiden. And to make sure, looked again when, what do you think she beheld squatting on the manger? Something brown, either a large brown rat or a small brown man. But she held her tongue, since being a very little girl, people sometimes laughed at her for the strange things she saw. She was quite certain that she did see them for all that. So she and the rest of the children went indoors and to bed. When they were fast asleep, something happened. Something so curious that the youngest boy, who thinking he had heard Jess neighing, got up to look out, was afraid to tell, lest he too should be laughed at, and went to bed immediately. In the middle of the night, a little old brown man carrying a lantern, or at least having a light in his hand that looked like a lantern, went and unlocked Jess's stable and patted her pretty head. At first she started, but soon she grew quiet and pleased, and let him do what he chose with her. He began rubbing her down, making the same funny hissing with his mouth that Bill did, and all grooms do. I never could find out why. But Jess evidently liked it, and stood as good as possible. Isn't it nice to be clean? said the wee man, talking to her as if she were a human being or a brownie. And I dare say your poor little legs ache with standing still so long. Shall we have a run together? The moon shines bright in the clear, cold night. Dear me, I'm talking poetry. But brownies are not poetical fairies, quite commonplace, and up to all sorts of work. So while he talked, he was saddling and bridling Jess, she not objecting in the least. Finally, he jumped on her back. Off, said the stranger, off, off, and away, sang Brownie, mimicking a song of the cooks. People in that house often heard their songs repeated in the oddest way, from room to room, everybody fancying it was somebody else that did it. But it was only the Brownie. Now, a southerly wind in a cloudy sky proclaimed a hunting morning, or night, for it was the middle of the night, though bright as day. And Jess galloped, and the brownie sat on her back as merrily as if they had gone hunting together all their days. Such a steeple chase it was. They cleared into the farmyard at a single bound, and went flying down the road, across the ploughed field, and into the wood. Then out into the open country, and by and by into a dark, muddy lane. And oh, how muddy the Devonshire lanes can be sometimes. Let's go into the water to wash ourselves, said brownie and coaxed Jess into a deep stream, which she swam as bravely as possible. She had not had such a frolic since she left her native Shetland Isles. Up the bank she scrambled, her long hair dripping as if she had been a water dog instead of a pony. Brownie, too, shook himself like a rat or a beaver, throwing a shower around him in all directions. Never mind, at it again, my lass, and he urged Jess into the water once more. Out she came, wetter and brisker than ever, and went back home through the lane and the wood and the ploughed field, galloping like the wind, and tossing back her ears and mane and tail, perfectly frantic with enjoyment. But when she reached her stable, the plight she was in would have driven any respectable groom frantic too. Her sides were white with foam, and the mud was sticking all over her like a plaster. As for her beautiful long hair, it was all caked together in a tangle, as if all the combs in the world would never make it smooth again. Her mane especially was plaited into knots, which people in Devonshire call elf locks, and say when they find them on their horses, that it is because the fairies have been riding them. Certainly, poor Jess had been pretty well ridden that night. When just as the dawn began to break, Gardner got up and looked into the farmyard. His sharp eye caught sight of the stable door, wide open. "'Well done, Bill,' shouted he. "'Up early at last. "'One hour before breakfast is worth three after.' "'But no Bill was there. "'Only Jess, trembling and shaking, "'all in a foam and muddy from head to foot, "'but looking perfectly cheerful in her mind. "'And out from under her forelegs ran a small creature, "'which Gardner mistook for Tiny. "'Only Tiny was gray, and this dog was brown, of course. "'I should not like to tell you all that was said to Bill.' when, an hour after breakfast time, he came skulking up to the farm. 
In fact, words failing, Gardner took a good stick and laid it about Bill's shoulders, saying he would either do this or tell the mistress of him, and how he had left the stable door open all night, and some bad fellow had stolen Jess and galloped her all across the country, till, if she hadn't been the cleverest pony in the world, she could have never got back again. Bill durst not contradict his explanation of the story, especially as the key was found hanging up in its proper place by the kitchen door. And when he went to fetch it, he heard the most extraordinary sound in the coal cellar close by, like somebody snoring or laughing. Bill took to his heels and did not come back for a whole hour. But when he did come back, he made himself as busy as possible. He cleaned Jess, which is half a day's work at least. Then he took the little people a ride, and afterwards put his stable in the most beautiful order, and altogether was such a changed bill that the gardener told him he must have left himself at home and brought back somebody else. Whether or not, the boy certainly improved, so that there was less occasion to find fault with him afterwards. Jess lived to be quite an old pony, and carried a great many people, little people always, for she never herself grew any bigger. But I don't think she ever carried a brownie again. End of Adventure the Fourth